All right. Welcome everyone to this afternoon's session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. This afternoon, we will be focusing on a new book, June 4th, The Tiananmen Protesters and the Beijing Massacre of 1989 by Simon Fraser University historian, Jeremy Brown, a book which was published just two months ago in April. And joining us today as commentators are Anna Wang and Joseph Turigian. I'm Eric Arneson from the George Washington University, co-chair of the Washington History Seminar, along with my colleague, Christian Osterman of the Wilson Center. The seminar is a collaborative venture of the Woodrow Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program and the American Historical Association's National History Center. And for over the past decade, the seminar has been meeting weekly, usually, if not always, on Mondays, in pre-COVID times, in person at the Wilson Center, and since pandemic restrictions, here in the virtual realm. We have a lineup of weekly sessions still ahead of us this season that'll carry us into the end of July, including one this coming Monday, June 7th at 4 p.m. when we discuss Donald Ritchie's new book, The Columnist, Leaks, Lies, and Libel in Drew Pearson's Washington. Behind the scenes are two people who make these seminars possible, Pete Bierstecker of the Wilson Center and Rachel Wheatley of the National History Center. And we'd like to thank our individual donors whose contributions help support this programming. As always, we invite you to join their ranks. On the logistics front, you should know that today's session is being recorded and can soon be found on our institution's respective websites. And when we get to the question and answer section of the webinar, we ask those with questions to use the raise hand function or the Q&A function on Zoom. To those watching on Facebook Live, you can email questions to Rachel Wheatley, whose email address is posted in the chat function. We'll call on as many folks as we can. And with that, I turn the screen over to Christian Osterman, who will be moderating today's session. Christian, the Zoom screen, all yours. Great, thank you, Eric, and uh, welcome everyone to this Washington History Seminar. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce our um, key speaker today, uh, Professor Jeremy Brown. Uh, Dr. Brown is Associate Professor of Modern Chinese History at Simon Fraser University. He specializes in the social history of modern China. Um, he is the author of City versus Countryside in Ma Mao's China, Negotiating the Divide, published in 2012, and is the editor of Maoism at the Grassroots, Everyday Life in China's Era of High Socialism, published in 2015, co-edited with Matthew Johnson. And of course, June 4th, the volume we'll be discussing today. Um, Jeremy moved uh, to Burnaby in 2008 after completing his PhD at the University of California, San Diego. Since 2014, Dr. Brown has served as editor of the Cambridge, editor of um, Cambridge Studies and the History of the People's Republic of China, a book series published by Cambridge University Press. It's um, my great pleasure to turn the Zoom room over uh, to him. Jeremy, all yours. Thank you so much, Christian. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Pete and Rachel, for making this event possible. Uh, I want to start by respectfully acknowledging that the place where I wrote this book and the place where I am right now is the traditional, ancestral, unceded territory of the Tsleil-Waututh, Quaquitlam, Squamish, and Musqueam nations. And I should give everybody a content warning right now that I'm going to be discussing some graphic, disturbing history covering massacres and mass killings. And this is a really intense and painful week for survivors and atrocities of massacres, including in the province where I am in British Columbia, violence by settlers against indigenous people in British Columbia where I live has been in the headlines in a major way here in Canada over the past few, day few days. And that's because last week, the Tekemloops Te Sequepum nation confirmed that it had found the remains of 215 children who were students at the Kamloops Indian Residential School, which was operated by the Catholic Church and overseen by and later operated by the Canadian federal government between 1890 and 1978. Those of you in the US are probably seeing in the news yesterday and today marks the 100th anniversary of the massacre and burning of Greenwood when a white mob killed and destroyed the lives and livelihoods of black people in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So this is a week when 
appropriately, there's a lot of painful and necessary attention being paid to the legacy and aftermath of atrocities and massacres that have been covered up and marginalized or ignored by power holders and perpetrators alike. Kamloops, Tulsa, uh, Beijing. And each of these atrocities is so different and unique that it is painful and distracting and wrong to put them in the same sentence. I just did say them in the same sentence, but I don't like it because each event deserves undivided attention. Uh, but I'm also noticing overlap and connections and discussion of these massacres. For example, one commenter online reacting to a Chinese language interview that I did about my research on the Beijing massacre of 1989 said directly in Chinese, well, what about the Tulsa massacre? The US has massacres too, research that. And another commenter referenced genocide against indigenous people in North America, calling it the biggest genocide in world history. So these are comments written in Chinese responding to my research about Beijing. And they're trying to deflect attention from the Beijing massacre of 1989 and to disqualify me. I'm an American, I'm also a Canadian from writing about something that happened in China because massacres and atrocities have also happened in the US and Canada. And so that, that kind of deflection and whataboutism doesn't work on me because I actually welcome that. I welcome comparative discussions of atrocities that perpetrators have covered up or downplayed. I say, yes, let's pay attention to all of these things. Non-Canadians and non-Americans are correct to point out difficult and unresolved moments in Canadian or American history. So researching the history of massacres is worth doing, even when govern governments or political parties tell you that you can't do it and put all kinds of obstacles in your way. And that's why I wrote this book. When a turning point in Chinese history, as important as the Beijing massacre of 1989 is censored and covered up and deemed so sensitive that you can't talk about it and you can't go near it as a researcher or a scholar, that's not only an insult to the victims and survivors of the massacre, it's a slap in the face to the entire discipline of history to say this is a no-go zone, you're not allowed to research this. So more than 10 years ago, I took that affront as a personal challenge. I decided that eventually I was gonna re research the history of 1989 in China. And one thing that really kickstarted me was a book by a Canadian author named Denise Chong. Her book is called Egg on Mao. And this is a book about three working class men from Hunan province. Their names are Lu Decheng, Yu Dongyue, and Yu Zhijian. And these three men went to Beijing in May of 1989, 32 years ago, to support and join in a protest movement. And they went to try to talk to the student leaders of this protest movement in Tiananmen Square, the center of the capital of China. Uh, but the student leaders wouldn't talk to them. So these three men decided to take matters into their own hands. They posted some slogans, some posters saying down with the dictatorship of the Chinese Communist Party. And then they filled some eggs with paint and they threw these eggs up at the huge portrait of Mao Zedong, which overlooks Tiananmen Square, vandalizing it. And that portrait is up there still today overlooking Tiananmen Square without those paint splatters. So this book came to me and I'm embarrassed to admit that when a pro promotional copy of Denise Chong's Egg on Mao arrived in my office, my first reaction was to say that the last thing that the world needs is a book about these, these three men. And that's because I had internalized the student leaders narrative that the egg throwers were troublemakers whose vandalism gave the Communist Party an excuse to crack down on the protests. And in fact, the students grabbed and detained these three men who threw the eggs immediately after they threw them and they took them straight to the police station and said and demanded a receipt saying that we were saying that the police were arresting these guys. Um, and these three men's prison sentence were, sentences were really long. One of them received a life sentence, another received 20 years, another received 16 years for the crime of counter, spreading counter-revolutionary propaganda. And uh, they suffered terribly in prison. And sadly, I hadn't even paid attention to or cared about these men. I had totally dismissed them, but fortunately, my curiosity about this book overcame my intellectual arrogance and I opened it up. I cracked open Denise Chong's book and I highly recommend it because it blew my mind. It showed me the value of focusing on the diversity of Chinese people's experiences in 1989 beyond the students in the square and beyond the top leadership in Beijing. Office workers, farmers in the provinces, they, working class people outside of Beijing, Tibetans in Lhasa, Uyghurs in Urumqi, they all had grievances, they had hopes, they had smart ideas about how to make life in China better, but their voices and stories have not been heard enough. And Denise Chong addresses this in her book, Anna Wong's book, Inconvenient Memories. Anna Wong is with us here today. Her, her book, Inconvenient Memories, is another book that does this really well. 
And so they inspired me to write a new history of the Tiananmen protests, of the Beijing massacre, and of the nationwide protest movement and nationwide crackdown outside of Beijing throughout China, in which I'm trying to prioritize voices that have been neglected. And my, my original plan was to teach some undergraduate seminars about Tiananmen Square and June 4th to get me ready for the day sometime in the future when it would be possible when China becomes open and free enough to openly do research about 1989 in China. Yeah, uh, when I could go to the archives and get archival documents about it, I could openly do oral history interviews. Uh, but Denise Chong's book convinced me not to wait for a day that might not ever come in my lifetime. Uh, she proved that it's possible to do good work about 1989 under these restrictive conditions. And so I went for it outside of China. I gathered as many documents as I could. I talked to participants, I talked to survivors, and guess what? I actually did do research inside China. Uh, I went to the National Library in Beijing and photocopied a good number of books and articles about spring 1989. And the librarians and the staff in the photocopy rooms were friendly and helpful. They didn't bat an eye. They were happy to photocopy those books for me. And I, I went to bookstores and flea markets and I bought openly published material about 1989. One of the most useful and interesting ones is a Q&A style book called 500 Questions About Quelling the Counter-Revolutionary Rebellion. And yes, it does go through exactly 500 questions and answers, some of which include details about the military action in Tiananmen Square that I haven't seen written about or disclosed anywhere else. And I bought that book in China, brought it home to Canada, no problem. And when I, when I told my friends in, in context in and outside of China that I was writing a book about the events of 1989, their reaction was overwhelmingly positive and encouraging. People in China told me, good, thank you. Please write this book. The world needs this book, but it, there's no safe way for scholars inside China to write it right now. Uh, so here's what I'm doing in this book. I am following an independent scholar named Wu Renhua, who's written three books about this topic in treating June 4th as a three-stage event. Stage one was a nationwide protest movement between April 15th and June 3rd of 1989. And this protest movement was opposing corruption among officials. It was calling for greater transparency in government affairs. It was calling for freedom of speech. It, it called for the existence and formation of, of autonomous student organizations and independent worker unions. And it called for open dialogue between people and the government. And in support of this movement, millions of citizens of Beijing, non-students, workers, officials, marched in support of students who were hunger striking. And there were protests in every province and autonomous region of China during these about approximately 50 days of protests in spring of 1989. And people joined these protests for all kinds of reasons. Some people had their hopes raised by the increasing freedoms and economic opportunities of the 1980s. These were genuine and people wanted more. Uh, some people were angry and traumatized by the violence of the one child policy in the 1980s. And they were traumatized by arbitrary arrests in this anti-crime campaign called the Strike Hard Campaign. And in the case of Tibet and Xinjiang and other places in China, people were upset about restrictions on religious freedom. So people had all kinds of reasons to be happy or upset. And this combination of high hopes, which were sometimes dashed, plus simmering anger, pushed people to hit the streets, to organize, to march, and demand change in spring of 1989. Stage two of this event called June 4th was the Beijing massacre of June 3rd, 4th, 5th, and 6th, 1989. Yes, it started on June 3rd and it continued on the 4th and the 5th and the 6th. And I should warn you that this part of the book and this part of my talk is disturbing. So if you're upset by discussions of victims of a massacre, get ready now. And if you need to step away to take care of yourself, please do take care of yourself. What I do in my discussion of this stage of June 4th is I draw on the research of the Tiananmen mothers these are parents whose children went out on June 3rd or June 4th and they never came home. And I draw on this, the research of, of these parents uh, to write a victim-centered account of the massacre. And I'm looking for patterns in who died, where they died, and what they were doing when they died. China's leader at the time, Deng Xiaoping, mobilized more than 180,000 troops from the People's Liberation Army to impose martial law in Beijing. And on the evening of June 3rd, soldiers with assault rifles and troops driving tanks and armored personnel carriers invaded the China's capital city of Beijing. The 38th Group Army, 
shot indiscriminately at crowds and at buildings as it moved toward Tiananmen Square from the west side of Beijing. They had permission to use deadly force to make their way to the square and clear the square between dawn, before, before dawn the next morning. That was their deadline. And the 15th Airborne Division did the same thing as they shot their way toward the square from the south of Beijing. We don't know exactly how many people died um, because of restrictions on research, but at a minimum, I would say it was 728 people died. At a maximum, it was perhaps a little bit higher than 2,600 dead. And most people died on the approach to the square, not in Tiananmen Square itself. Some of those who died were students. Uh, many more victims were ordinary civilians who went out to actually protect the students in the square. Some people went out because they wanted to witness history or they were curious, it was loud outside, they wanted to see what was going on. Other people were just commuting to work or trying to run errands. A couple of people who were shot were trying to get medicine for their sick children going to the pharmacy. And they had no intention at all of encountering the army, but the army of their own country shot and killed them. So I'm gonna name just a few of the people who the army shot and killed on June 3rd and June 4th. And the only thing these people were doing was trying to get to and from work. Liu Junhe, he sold watermelons at Tianmen, just south of Tiananmen Square. Dai Wei was a cook at a Peking duck restaurant. Zhang Runing was a 32 year old woman who worked at China Radio International. Wang Hongqi worked at a research institute. Wang Qingzong and Chen Ziqi were drivers. Li Chun was a cook and Wang Junjing was a factory technician. They were trying to go to work. They were trying to get home from work. They came across the army. They were shot and killed by the army. And when, so when we look closely at who died and what they were doing when they died, it becomes crystal clear that the Beijing massacre was not necessary and it was not inevitable. Uh, stage three of this event called June 4th was and is the aftermath of the massacre. And this is where I was able to uncover some Communist Party written sources that scholars haven't cited before about something called the Double Qing Movement. In Chinese, this was uh, Qing Cha Qing Li Gong Zuo, meaning purging and sorting out. And this movement mandated a nationwide crackdown in the second half of 1989 and the first half of 1990, in which people labeled as rioters were arrested and sentenced. Everyone who had marched or signed petitions during the protest was supposed to confess in writing about what they had done. And all Communist Party officials in cities throughout China had to re-register their party membership to renew their loyalty to this regime that had just carried out a massacre. This crackdown continues through the present day. This crackdown continues through today. And by that, I mean, the people who opposed the massacre were punished and they continue to be punished. And those people include parents whose children were shot and killed by the army. It includes people who were wounded grievously by the army. They're punished for their existence let alone when they, or if they try to speak up. Uh, and at the same time, the people who carried out the massacre and who benefited from the massacre were rewarded and promoted in the aftermath, promoted all the way up to the top leadership of the Communist Party through the present day. And the last thing I wanna to touch on in my opening remarks here would be five chapters that I call alternative paths chapters that come at the end of each section of the book. And I, I wrote these chapters because I noticed that a lot of the people who took part in the protests and who witnessed the massacre had really intense, deep regrets about what happened and they were obsessed about how things might have unfolded differently. They kept asking and saying things like, if only somebody had done this differently or what if somebody had made a different choice, imagine this better result. So what I did is I noticed so many of these remarks that I actually wrote a history of alter alternative paths and key turning points that participants themselves had identified as moments that could have averted a massacre or led to a better outcome. So I didn't make up imaginary history myself. I actually dr am drawing from the testimonies of survivors and perpetrators alike, the memoirs of student leaders uh, like Chai Ling and Li Lu. They're just full of speculation about what would have happened if government leaders or protesters had made different choices. Hunger strike versus no hunger strike, for example. Or the student leaders discussed should we escalate the, the, the protest by actually starting a campaign of self-immolation in Beijing? Should we set ourselves on fire? They discussed that, they didn't do it, but that was a, a choice that they thought about and they didn't do it. Um, the memoirs of top Communist Party leaders as well, like uh, Premier Li Peng and General Secretary Zhao Ziyang, uh, 
they also speculate a lot about how things might have unfolded differently. If, to give one example, if Zhao Ziyang, the general secretary of the Communist Party at the time, if he had not left the country, left China to go on an official visit to North Korea in late 1989, as just as protests were escalating in a key moment, what would have happened if he had found a way to actually stay in China and deal with things? Uh, because things took a very different turn when he was out, out of Beijing. I, and I, let me end now by mentioning one survivor who I told about my plan to explore alternative paths in my book. And I, this story is not in the book, um, but I was, I was really excited. I knew he was in Beijing in 1989 and I wanted to share this idea about, I wanna write these alternative path chapters. I wanted to get his feedback about the ideas. And he said, yeah, I guess it's fine to do that, but let me tell you my story. And he said, on the night of June 3rd, he was standing in a crowd in an alley north of the main east-west road heading toward Tiananmen Square, watching and listening in utter disbelief at the gunfire that was coming from near him when soldiers with assault rifles turned their guns into the alley and started shooting and a bullet whizzed by his head and shot the person standing right directly next to him and behind him. And this, this, this person gets shot, falls down, bleeding, is carried away by onlookers, brought to the hospital. My friend doesn't know what happened to him, but he told me this story of surviving, but seeing death around him. And he said to me, look, this happened. This is my real story. This happened. So if you're going to write about alternative paths, don't write about small things or trivial things. Write about big moments that really mattered that could have actually made a difference. And so that's what I tried to do. And that's where I'll leave it for now. And uh, I would look forward to the commentary and to everyone's questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jeremy, for this, um, to get us started um, in this discussion. Let me uh, remind uh, our audience that there are three ways you can uh, join the discussion and um, make uh, your own intervention, be it a question or a comment. Um, you can get in line now by using the raise hand function in the Zoom functionality. You'll be queued and we will be calling on you um, to uh, um, pose your question or comment. That's our preferred way because we like the live interaction. You can also use the Q&A uh, functionality at the top um, of your Zoom screen. Uh, or if you're uh, watching, following us on Facebook Live, you can email your question to Rachel Wheatley at rwheatley at historians.org. We'll now go to our first commentator, um, we we're very fortunate to have uh, two um, panelists coming from two scholars, two experts coming from very different perspectives um, uh, uh, on the subject. Um, and I think we'll hopefully complement each other really well. Our first commentator is uh, Anna Wang, born and raised in Beijing, China. She received her BA from Peking University as a full-time bilingual writer. She has published nine books in Chinese. These include two short story collections, one essay collection, four novels, and two translations. One of her short, stories collect, short story collections was translated into English and published in 2014 as Beijing Women Stories. Her first book in English, a 2019 memoir, Inconvenient Memories, recounts her experience and observation of the Tiananmen Square protest in 1989 from the perspective of a member of the emerging middle class. The book won an independent press award in cultural and social issues category in 2020. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you, uh, Ms. Wang, to uh, the Washington History Seminar. The Zoom room is yours. Thank you. I'm very honored to share my feedback with you of Jeremy Brown's new book. I was born in China and I immigrated to Canada in 2007. And uh, I was there uh, during the Tiananmen protest. And uh, when I read Jeremy's book, I feel that I learned a lot. Even though I was there, I still uh, learned a lot from his book. So the first point of my feedback of his book is that he painted this comprehensive picture of China, of every class in China. He described the highest party officials and the student leaders, and of course, 
those two groups are very important. They are major players in this history event. Uh, so any book about Tiananmen Square couldn't leave them out. But he also look beyond them, like uh, he talked about uh, the Lu Decheng. He's uh, another example of ordinary people, how their life impacted in the 1980s. He also described a very interesting figure. His name is uh, Lai Changxing. And uh, so Lai Changxing is, uh, he's a wanted man um, in, in China in the 1990s. When I first landed in China, it, it, when I first landed in, in Canada, he was in the middle of this legal battle with Canadian government because uh, he, he started his import business in the 1980s. His company at its peak was responsible for one sixth of the national oil imports. Uh, in the late 1990s, he was implicated in corruption scandals involving a large smuggling ring. So he fled to Canada and uh, the Chinese government wanted him back and the Canadian government decided to, to deport him. So he fought this decision. When I was first in Canada, his news was all over the newspaper. Now, Lai Changxing, what I want to uh, point out is that I believe people like Lai Changxing were the antagonists of this student-led democratic movement in the sense that people like Lai Changxing may not mind the one-party dictatorship. In Jeremy's book, he laid out that these four choices for Chinese people. In the economy sector, we had this planned economy and a free market. In the political sector, we had this democracy and one-party dictatorship. The conservative force in the party wanted the planned economy and the dictatorship. Deng Xiaoping wanted a free market economy while keeping the Chinese Communist Party in power. The students, no doubt, they wanted democracy, but did they want a free market? That's the question. And uh, this question is, uh, has something to do with my personal experience. At that time, I was working for the Japanese company's Beijing office. Our company was just about to launch this first ever assembly plant in China. So when the Tiananmen protest started, my boss was very concerned because it seems in our for it seems the best interest for our company is that the conflict resolved peacefully, but things just kept spiraling down. My boss's opinion is that the student didn't want free market. I wasn't convinced by my boss, but I was suspicious to the students too. I certainly didn't want China to roll back to full planned economy because it would mean no foreign investment and I lost my job. So in my opinion, the Tiananmen Square massacre is Deng Xiaoping used his centralized military power to forcefully push forward his economic reform agenda. So after the Tiananmen massacre, the Western world imposed economic sanctions on China. Japan was the only industrialized country who maintained its economic ties with China. I still had my job and my boss told me that it was okay that Chinese people temporarily put aside their desire for democracy. He reasoned that as the economy developed democracy would eventually come along with it. I accepted his rationale. The 21st century saw China became the author of the most successful economic story in human history. Hundreds of millions raised from poverty into middle-class existence. I became a member of the middle class just as my boss promised me in the 1990s, but I didn't feel happy. Not only democracy didn't come to China, but the booming economy seemed to legitimize the one-party dictatorship. On the personal level, 
I didn't want my children to grow up in China. Basically, I think that's my opinion. If you want to prosper in China, you must not have integrity. That's why I immigrated to Canada in the first place. But I must admit that without the economic reform in the 1990s, without China becoming the member of the World Trade Organization, I wouldn't have had the resource to establish a new life in North America. After I became a Canadian, I, I didn't want to think about the issues in China. I just want to raise my kids as Canadian. But things in China continually affect the choice of Chinese people worldwide, like this pandemic. In the early stage of the pandemic, I was very worried about my parents because the information wasn't transparent enough in China. But then after a couple of months, my parents began to worry about me since I'm living in uh, California now because my children are going to school here. So they think the Americans have their own opinion and that's terrible. They think the government should force everybody to wear a mask, should force everybody to get vaccinated. And they feel grateful that they have this powerful government that can force anyone to do anything. So from my interaction with my friends who are still in China now, I feel that after this pandemic, they, the Chinese people, they simply believe even stronger that one party rule is superior than democracy. In my opinion, this mentality could be traced back to the handling of the Tiananmen protest. The Tiananmen protest didn't necessarily evolve to a massacre, but it just happened. The worst outcome of this massacre was to tell Chinese people that you couldn't have both, either democracy or prosperity, you had to choose one. This logic started from the Tiananmen massacre, continued to dominate China in the past 30 years, and it got reinforced by this pandemic. So now I'm on to the second point of my feedback to Jeremy's new book. What impressed me the most is that he points out the alternative paths at every stage in the unfolding of the event. The chapters about the road not taken are what touched me the deepest. But the reading experience is painful, thinking that Chinese people couldn't have had both. China could have continued to open up its economy and at the same time get rid of the one party dictatorship. How I wish we had a time travel machine to go back to 1989 and had the course of history change. Last but not least, in Jeremy's study, he notices, quote, the hierarchies of Chinese society in 1989 were patriarchal, sexist, anti-rural, and Han supremacy. And examining histories of Zhong force reproduce, and uh, existing histories of Zhong force reproduce these harmful hierarchies, unquote. In this book, I found his description of a protest by Muslims on May 12th. They protested about book. Uh, they thought the book is a literature work. They thought that work is disrespectful to their culture. And uh, I, I was on the Tiananmen Square almost every day, but I, I missed this moment and I hadn't heard of this protest until I read this book. So I think in conclusion, I learned a great deal about Tiananmen Massacre from Jeremy's book. I, as a person who was there, who knew that I knew a lot about this topic, I still learned a great deal from his book. Uh, and uh, thank you for Jeremy for taking interest in this section of Chinese history. And the congratulations on the, public, on the publication of your book. And I hope your book can sell many, many copies. Thanks, Anna. Um, let me ask you, do you have any questions for Jerry based on yeah, your reading? Yeah, yeah, I, I'm interested that, that um, because uh, in China, we heard this rumor for many, many years. It's a conspiracy rumor that uh, 
the conservative force in the highest level of Chinese official, they purposely provoke the students to go to extreme. Did you hear any rumor during your research? Or did you find any evidence to support this theory? Thank you. Jeremy? Thank you so much, Anna, for your reaction and your feedback. It's really gratifying to hear. On this uh, specific question, I mean, Chai Ling's memoir, she does say some random person who, in retrospect, seems suspicious to her, who seemed to be fairly highly placed, said, oh, you ever think about doing a hunger strike? Uh, in advance, before the hunger strike. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's interesting. But I think that that's not enough to cause a hunger strike to happen. I think that is sort of insulting to the strategic intelligence of the protesters who many of them did not want to do a hunger strike. Many of them thought that was a terrible idea. They thought that it would inflame the situation further and the strategic brilliance of the hunger strikers themselves who said, no, we have to take advantage of this moment now. And, and it led to a huge outpouring of support. So if it is true that there was a conspiracy, we don't have any written evidence of that from, um, from any of the leaders, from any of the memoirs that I have access to. Um, but if there was, uh, that was just a tiny drop in the bucket of this spontaneous movement that included all kinds of people with all kinds of, of ideas arguing with each other and, and on, over the course of 50 very short days, uh, you know, just trying to figure out what to do. So it wasn't manipulatable or it, it wasn't manipulable in the way that that kind of uh, a rumor would suggest would be my answer. Thank you. Thank you. Let me introduce our uh, second commentator and bring Joseph into the conversation. Dr. Joseph Terigian is assistant professor at the School of International Service at American University here in Washington, DC. Previously, he was a Stanton Nuclear Security Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, a postdoctoral and a fellow at, Prince, at the Princeton Harvard China and the World Program a postdoctoral and pre-doctoral fellow at Stanford's Center for International Security and Cooperation, and a pre-doctoral fellow at George Washington University's Institute for Security and Conflict Studies. He was also an IREC scholar affiliated with the Higher School of Economics in Moscow and a Fulbright scholar at Fudan University in Shanghai. He studies elite politics and foreign relations in China and Russia, has written uh, widely on this subject. Um, he is currently a Wilson Center China Fellow, and we at the History and Public Policy Program are proud to call him a global fellow with the program as well. He's certainly part of uh, the HAP family. Uh, his uh, earlier, one of his uh, many publications in, uh, uh, that's relevant for today's discussion includes Xi Jinping's Tiananmen Family Lessons published in Foreign Policy last year. Um, and uh, he has a manuscript forthcoming with Yale University Press, Prestige, Manipulation and Coercion, Elite Power Struggles after, Ma after Stalin and Mao. Joseph, it's great to have you here. The floor is yours. Well, first of all, I have to admit that I feel a little strange coming onto a panel with someone who personally participated in the protests uh, for a book that was written by someone who spent so many years looking at the social, economic, gender background uh, to uh, the uh, protests. Uh, I do have uh, an interest in elite politics. So uh, my comments here will primarily be about why I think Professor Brown's book uh, is so pathbreaking uh, and important uh, in that regard. So the 1989 crackdown is also a story about the nature of power at the apex of the Chinese political system. And I've looked at the writings by Chinese scholars and realized that what they've written and said about that incident compared to what's been written in English uh, were very, very, very different. Uh, and what Professor Brown has done in this book is brought into a very readable uh, um, 
project uh, that represents the cutting edge of all of these scholars, but also a lot of insights uh, that would not have been possible if he hadn't been able to do uh, so much of his own uh, research uh, into primary sources. And that is an especially important achievement uh, because as he was saying, and as he goes into more detail in the book, uh, there are an extraordinary number of rumors uh, about what had happened that persist. And in fact, if you look at uh, documents from the Canadian archives, the US archives, the British archives, uh, and you talk to people who participated, you realize just how many false pieces of information were floating around and many of them continue to um, persist uh, even today. So the fact that um, Professor Brown has written this book, uh, I think is really crucial. Uh, first, I'll make a few brief comments about why I think the way the book was written was innovative. And then I'll mention a couple of things about what it means um, for how we think about Chinese elite politics. The first is that even though Professor Brown was just telling us about how many people were encouraging him to write this book, it's not a common book that you would see either within the discipline of history or political science or, or China studies, because there's this belief uh, that it's impossible to do history that that's, that's so recent, right? Uh, that especially because the Chinese political system is so opaque, um, because it's a black box, that trying to do uh, history from that period uh, would be more like journalism uh, or something like that. I think Professor Brown would admit that there's still a lot of puzzles that he didn't solve in this book. And there may be one or two things uh, that he got wrong, but I'll never forget when Roderick McFarger told me the story about how one party historian from China criticized him for getting something wrong. Uh, and McFarger was responsive, or, of course I got it wrong, I didn't know about it. Uh, so even if this isn't the final statement on Tiananmen, because it does bring us to the cutting edge, I think it's still a, a major, major accomplishment. The other thing that makes this book is unique, and this is something that um, Professor Brown mentioned, is that it's full of counterfactuals, right? Uh, and a lot of the time people will encourage you not to do that because of the sense that, of course you would know, because history is history and we can never prove what would have happened otherwise. But I think for a project like this, counterfactuals are uh, essential. Uh, for two reasons. The first is that counterfactuals force us to be explicit about what we think mattered for a particular outcome, right? But the other is that Tiananmen Square was such a watershed moment. It was such a crucial moment in the history of China that to the extent that it was a contingent outcome, I think really will tell us a lot about what's possible within the Chinese political system. Uh, and whether or not uh, that kind of regime uh, could have moved into another direction. But also because a lot of the rumors that, we've, that uh, surround Tiananmen, I'll talk a little bit about this more in a second, has to do with uh, certain particular moments and myths about them. So necessarily we have to ask what would have happened if somebody hadn't made a particular comment or taken a particular action. Uh, the next thing that makes us unique, I think, as a book of history uh, is that it is history. Now, what do I mean by that? You know, as Professor Brown spoke at the beginning of this, this is an emotionally charged, politically sensitive uh, point in, in world history, right? And I think there's a motivation, there's a pressure, I don't know what to call it, for people when they write books like this to select information not based on how convincing it is as a piece of evidence, but whether or not it fits a narrative that makes the bad guys look bad and the good guys look good. Counterintuitively, I think the Professor Brown's book is powerful precisely because it's a cautious book in the sense that it never goes beyond what the evidence actually says to make a political point. And that's not an easy thing to do ever, but also I think particularly during a time when the CCP is not especially popular in many circles around the world, uh, but also when writing about um, events like this, um, uh, they, they can be, it can be challenging uh, to pursue an objectivity, which is of course impossible, but also to try to keep as close to what the evidence says uh, as possible. Uh, I'll conclude with a few comments about elite politics. 
uh, and, and what this tells us, uh, what this book tells us. Uh, so very often, uh, there's a view that the Chinese Communist Party uh, as a whole had decided that the students were a threat to the regime uh, and that there was a consensus within the elite uh, that if violence was not used uh, to uh, destroy uh, this uh, campaign, uh, that uh, the days were numbered. Uh, but first of all, in, uh, what, what Professor Brown shows is that, you know, the student positions were not always maximalist. They would have been hard to meet. And that's where I think the counterfactuals really get into places that could provide a lot of grist for a discussion. Uh, but the, the big picture is that this was not a case of the Politburo Standing Committee, uh, the Politburo, um, the national legislature, the military, uh, looking at these scary students and deciding that something had to be done, but that this was a story about Deng Xiaoping, right? And it wasn't just a story about Deng Xiaoping, it was a story about Deng Xiaoping uh, taking actions that were illegal, even according to uh, the CCP's own uh, ambiguous uh, rules about how decisions uh, should be made. Uh, the last uh, meeting of the uh, Politburo Standing Committee on May 8, the last meeting of the Politburo on May 10, supported Zhao Ziyang's uh, position to use democratic and peaceful method to solving the crisis. Uh, and he was still general secretary of the party and illegally prevented from calling further meetings of the Politburo, Politburo Standing Committee uh, by Dong. Now, very often, whenever you pick up a newspaper and you read about Xi Jinping, one of the very first things that you read is that he is dismantling the system of collective leadership that had been established during the Deng Xiaoping era. The Tiananmen Square crisis is a perfect stress test to demonstrate how one particular leader who is not the general secretary of the party could take an action that was so deeply unpopular among the party, the government, and the military and push China into a course that most people, including many party elders like Chen Yun, who is generally seen as conservative, uh, didn't think was necessary, right? Uh, I'll conclude with one last point, which is that um, Professor Brown correctly notes that he is one of the first people to write about the purge within the party uh, after uh, the Tiananmen Square crackdown. Uh, and one of the people who had to go through that process of re-registering with the party was Xi Jinping's own father who had to write a sort of self-criticism in July of 1990. So it was really quite uh, expansive uh, and, uh, and extensive. So uh, I'll finish with a question for Professor Brown, which is uh, when you were looking at this, uh, uh, the counterfactuals, had you thought to yourself the biggest counterfactual, which had been that um, Deng Xiaoping had died in January of 1989, something like that. Uh, what you think the outcome uh, would, um, would have been. Theoretically, would it have been possible for the CCP to move to a direction of uh, addressing grievances, finding grievances, institutionalizing grievances, uh, or was the, 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 the project uh, from the start uh, destined, so to speak, uh, to end up in a place where they decided that tightening the screws uh, would be the only future as opposed to loosening up. Thank you, Joseph, for those uh, wonderful remarks and for that question. Yeah, Deng Xiaoping died in February of 1997, just a few days after I arrived in China for the first time. No connection between those two events, uh, as far as I know. Uh, he did not die in 1989. Um, he could have died, you know, you could do a counterfactual, he could have died at any moment. Um, but the counterfactual that is related to that, that I think I do touch on, is the idea of Dong uh, retiring as a matter of course, or really stepping back and saying, I'm done influencing politics, which was people had discussions about that. I'm sure people had discussions about what do we do if Dong dies. Um, but if Dong had actually retired in 1986, before he decided to take down Hu Yaobang, 
uh, I think you do see Hu Yaobang and Zhao Ziyang continuing along the path that they had seemed committed to, although they were still subject to a lot of influence from the elders who didn't hold official uh, positions. So it wasn't just Deng Xiaoping, it was uh, Chen Yun, Bo Yibo, Wang Zhen, uh, Li Xianyan, Yang Shangkun, all these other 80 year old plus uh, people who all thought of themselves as indispensable and that their advice needed to be heard by the younger leaders. And of course, Deng Xiaoping was the most indispensable of all because of his revolutionary seniority. So if he dies in January 1989, those other elders don't go away because they're still as active as possible and they're still going to try to step up. The next most senior guy uh, would have probably been the, the new most indispensable decider because he had more revolutionary seniority than Zhao Ziyang did. Uh, so it is this system of old man politics that you've written about and that uh, Zhong Yanling of, of uh, Zhongzhi University in Taipei has written about so well that it's a system in which one person, Deng Ye, was at the center, but it's a system of many elders who are unable to step back and actually retire and let the general secretary uh, do the job. Thank you. And thanks again to both Anna and Joseph for your very thoughtful uh, comments. We, uh, we would now like to open it up to the audience for your comments and questions. Again, you have several ways of, of intervening. Our preferred way is for you to use the raised hand function in the Zoom functionality and um, get in, in line um, uh, to pose your question. You can also use the Q&A function and you can email uh, Rachel Wheatley at rwheatley uh, at historians.org if you are um, following us on Facebook. Um, with that, um, and by the way, all your, the questions can also be, can be for everyone, uh, Joseph and Anna, as well as Jeremy, um, even though the session of course is focused on, on his book. Uh, we'll first go to uh, Carol Kalinowski. Please unmute yourself. There should be a prompt um, to asking you to approve that you're being unmuted. No, well, um, we'll try. We'll try you uh, um, a little later again. Um, a question from Dan Lieberman: um, Wasn't there martial law? If so, why were there people on the streets committing violence against the Chinese military that were operating under orders to to clear Tiananmen Square? Who killed these soldiers? Jeremy, do you want to take that on? Yeah. So martial law was declared. Um... On the eve it was decided and declared on May 19th, but it went into effect on May 20th. And Anna Wong's book is a wonderful this depiction of what that was like for ordinary people in Beijing. On the eve of martial law, uh, Anna's grandmother said, go buy as much food as you can. Everybody was lining up to, to buy food, to fill up buckets of water. Uh, the, everybody knew that the buses and subways were gonna stop running. So the whole city, especially people like Anna's grandmother who had lived through um, 1949, uh, when the, the communists took over the city, they had lived through military, uh, uh, you know, invasion before. Uh, they, they said, okay, let's get ready for this. Um, but what would you do if martial law is declared in response to a bunch of students protesting? What would you do? Uh, I'll tell you what a lot of people in Beijing did. They got mad and they said, what are you talking about martial law? These are students protesting and asking for transparency and freedom of speech. What? Martial law? And so people hit the streets and actually blocked the troops nonviolently. They just stood and blocked the troops for several days after martial law was declared. Uh, so, so if you look at the process of what happened over the day by day, uh, the, the millions of people in Beijing decided martial law is an illegitimate response. And in fact, as Joseph says, it's an illegal action that was not carried out or decided on 
through the actual procedures of the top leadership of the Communist Party. Uh, it didn't include a vote. It didn't include, it, it, it overrode the objections of the general secretary at the time. It was Deng Xiaoping overriding all these rules. So it was, it was an illegitimate decision at the top. The people at the time on the streets didn't know that. They just, they just decided it was morally Ill, 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 illegitimate and they just went out to block. Um, and they successfully blocked the, these, these troops from entering the city. They turned around and went away. So that's the context in which you get June 3rd, is that the people of Beijing had already blocked the entry of the troops into the city. And many of them thought, okay, well, if they come again, we'll just do it again. Um, so maybe you would have stayed home. Maybe that's safer. Maybe you would decide martial law is legitimate and I'm gonna stay home. And many, many people did. Many, many people stayed inside and did not go outside. Many people did go outside. Um, but Wu, Wu Renhua's research on your second question, Wu, Wu Renhua's research has shown in great detail um, that there was no violence or killing of soldiers until the soldiers started shooting. Soldiers started shooting after 9 p.m. at Wu Kesong on the west side of Beijing. And then they moved to Gongzhu Fan, and then they moved to Mushidi, and they were shooting. And there was such outrage and shock that the soldiers were using real bullets that people did actually fight back. And um, some soldiers were killed by protesters. Um, that, that number is in the teens. And the number of civilians who were killed is at a minimum 728, at a maximum 2,600. So, yes, we have to acknowledge that some protesters did kill soldiers. And that's a huge. Uh, part of the propaganda that the Communist Party spreads today to say, uh, look at our soldiers. Our soldiers got killed. Uh, that's where the focus is. So if you want to focus on that with your question, interesting. Uh, but let's look at the sequence of events. What happened first? What happened second? And that helps us to explain how you get to that point. Thank you. Uh, we have a really distinguished audience. Um, which, however, is being um, kind of shy about um, uh, getting into the conversation. So let me, um, at least directly, let me ask um, another question posted in, in the chat. Uh, an anonymous attendee writes, I was in Beijing during the entire situation on Friday. It was pouring rain and not a single demonstrator was manning any barricades or on the street. The PL PLA could have marched in and taken the square on the post. Why, why do you think that did not happen? Yes, yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, Li Peng's memoir describes that by June 2nd, that was Friday, right? Uh, June 3rd was Saturday, June 4th was Sunday. Um, by June 2nd, there were 25,000 troops surrounding the square. Many of them had entered through tunnels uh, from the west side of Beijing directly Underneath and enter, then entering the Great Hall of the People. Others were in the Ministry of State, uh, the, the Ministry of Public Security. Um, Twenty-five thousand against you're right, uh, a dwindling number of protesters. So yes, it, there were many possible ways to occupy the square without violence. And so that's a question that I think is going to have to wait for the next wave of researchers to come along and get into the military archives when that becomes possible to learn you know, why, um, why a, a much more massive invasion that took more time. I think it simply took more time to mobilize the scale of instead of 25,000, they went many more times than that uh, to have this invasion by, on the ground uh, to supplement those 25,000 on, on June 4th. And so, yeah, I think weather might have been a factor. Timothy Brook in his book uh, wanted, says that maybe a full moon was a factor. Lee Pong in his memoir says that it was, we had to clear it by Sunday because the number of protesters was gonna, uh, was gonna skyrocket on Sunday, which was the only day off back then for people in China. They got one day off on Sunday. And so that was the target. Um, so yeah, it's a good question that I think we, I, I, I hope this kind of question does spark further research. Thank you. A question from Aminda Smith. Um, Jeremy, I have not read the book yet, but I will as soon as I can get a copy. I get that your approach is different and focused on the victims, but I wonder if your book engages with the politics of the protesters and what they meant at the time and for the longer trajectory. Sure, and I see in another comment that this is actually Fabio asking the question using Aminda's computer, so hello okay. to both of you. Uh, 
Yeah, it's a good question. The protest movement, I think the most important thing to, that I want to bring up here is that the protest movement uh, lasted 50 days. And that's too short. I think that's too short to draw conclusive findings about it, as, other than to say, uh, we know what their demands were. We know what the student demands were um, because they had a list of demands. Uh, we know what the workers' demands were because they had a list of demands. There were worker organizations, the Beijing Worker Autonomous Federation. And we know what a lot of um, protesters in the provinces were asking for because we have transcripts of their dialogue meetings with officials uh, during this really interesting period of, of dialogue between officials and student protesters. Um, and so corruption and addressing corruption was at the top of the list. Freedom of speech and freedom of the press, especially people wanted to see the truth printed in the newspaper. Um, transparency, people wanted to know who the leaders were and why it looked like their children were getting so rich unfairly. Um, so over those 50 days, there were, there were a lot of mistakes. The students made a ton of mistakes in terms of not behaving very democratically themselves and argued a lot about how to make their movement more democratic and what the next step should be. And uh, I'll, I'll, those are some of the uh, you know, paths that were untaken that I think are really interesting to look at. The next steps were regrouping on campuses and trying to actually practice democracy within their organizations before taking other steps on the streets or going and talking to workers more, going and talking to farmers more. Uh, 50 days, that's all I got. Uh, and that's too short. Thank you. Eric, did you have a follow-up question? Yes. Um, and so perhaps you could elaborate a bit, a bit more about this. I think you, your point about 50 days being very short is quite apt. Um, at one point uh, in the book, and you cover so many more subjects than we could possibly get to in the course of an hour and a half webinar, you talk about the, rural, the urban rural divide um, and the sense that rural uh, Chinese uh, had a different agenda, um, a different set of concerns, one that was not met by or recognized fully by uh, the younger urban protesters whose conception of democracy, you said, uh, was uh, elitist. Could you talk about that divide um, uh, and what was elitist about the students' uh, uh, demands um, and what possibilities there would have been in that short 50 days uh, for anything like a more substantive alliance uh, to, to have, have been formed? Or is that simply because of the duration uh, and because of the repression, simply an impossibility? Yeah, this is a, a fantastic question. And it, let's see, where do, where do I wanna go with this? Um, a lot of the students came from rural backgrounds, but they had made it to the best universities in China and their parents back in the village were incredulous uh, that their students would, would question the system or rock the boat. What are you unhappy with? You've made it, right? You've got it made. This is, you're gonna get a great job after university. What do you have to protest about? Um, so there was not only a rural urban divide, there was a generational divide among parents who wanted their kids to play it safe. Um, but you'll notice in the demands, I, I described what the protest movement was about. What did I not say? I did not say uh, open democratic elections in which every citizen in China gets a vote, one person, one vote. I did not say that because that was not part of the movement. Uh, so there was a lot of talk about democracy and the meaning of democracy uh, at the time included really important elements of democracy, anti-corruption, transparency, freedom of press. Those are essential elements for democracy, but it did not include uh, an immediate switch to an American style electoral democratic system or a Canadian style parliamentary democratic system. It did not include that demand precisely because at the time China was at least 80% rural and that would mean uh, total rural domination in any election which a lot of the students didn't and would not want to support. And that's one of those harmful hierarchies in Chinese society that Anna mentioned that I, that I highlight here. And so there's so many examples of just a disconnect between rural people and the urban students, one of which is in the, the documentary Gate of Heavenly Peace where Wang Dan, the student leader is going to present a petition to the office of petitions. And there are a bunch of rural petitioners outside of the office, um, you know, doing this performance, this 
theatrical performance crying about uh, an injustice that had happened to them. And all the press is just following Wang Dan and focusing on him and everybody just totally ignoring uh, these rural protesters. And there's no conversation or no connection. They're like, I, wait a minute, or our, maybe we have the same grievances. Maybe we act, maybe our problems are connected here. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't happen. But what did happen was uh, when the students were forced to go underground after the massacre, who saved them? Who helped them escape? Who hid them in their homes? Rural people did and did not turn them in. They helped them get out of China. Uh, and so there was a sense was there was a sense of sympathy that you didn't do something bad. Uh, there was a sense uh, among the rural people who I've talked to that why did the government shoot people? Like so, there was no no sense of celebration in rural China about the shooting. It was a sense of well, you're a kid, uh, you're a university student. I'm going to hide you, and I'm not going to turn you in. So there was that connection of just shared humanity in the face of an atrocity that gives a bit of hope for maybe it could have evolved, maybe there could have been a chance if it had gone longer than 50 days. Thank you. One thing to keep in mind too, on the nature of the student protests and, and what they said they wanted, that message worked quite powerfully on a broad segment within the elite. Many within the Chinese Communist Party at the very top level, including elders, uh, did believe that it would have been possible for the Chinese Communist Party to not only meet those demands, but by doing so would push it further in a direction that the CCP wanted to go sooner or later anyway. So there's this very interesting speech that Yao Yilin, one of the members of the Politburo Standing Committee gives shortly after the crackdown. Uh, and he says, uh, of course, taking one step back would not have meant the immediate collapse of the country but would have been a step in the direction of a capitalist republic. And then he mentions Poland uh, and, and Hungary. So even he was saying that like, um, by, by the phrases that he used, admitting that um, at the time, it wasn't a choice between regime collapse or not, uh, but that it would have been one step uh, in a particular direction that in his mind would have led ultimately to collapse. And, I think that there is an international aspect of Tiananmen that hasn't come up a lot here, but, but which I think is important, um, but that um, other people um, believed the party could have met that challenge in a way that would have um, strengthened it as opposed um, to weakening it. Thank you, and, Joseph. And I think it was precisely because of the split within the party on how to respond um, that helps explain why Dong uh, responded in the way he did and this continuing phobia within the party about splitism in two centers and that kind of thing. Thank you. Question for Jeremy and Anna. Um, you paint a gruesome picture of the Tiananmen protests. Two questions. If sources on the protests and massacre are open, why is it not included in the Chinese curriculum? Can you trust these sources? And are you able to return to China to continue your research given your books and given that the Chinese government is still repressive? There's another question by Double Joy about um, how this book publication will um, uh, affect uh, your Jeremy's ability to visit mainland China for future research. Anna, do you, would you mind going first on this one? Uh, yeah, I can add, uh, uh, I can say simply, I, I, I don't think, uh, I would be banned from China because my book is written in English. It didn't reach much audience in China. So that's not a big problem for me. But my WeChat account got banned uh, for six times. <laughs> Thank you. Jeremy? Yeah, on that specific question, uh, I love to go to China. That's, that's where a lot of my work is. It's where a lot of my friends are. Um, and uh, fortunately, I've been able to keep going um, most recently in 2019, in which I've been very open about the fact that I'm writing this book. So that's great. I'd love to keep going. Um, not under my control, right? I don't make the decision on a visa application. Uh, and that's not under my control. But what kind of country would, would deny entry to somebody who writes a book, a history book, based on evidence that I deem credible, credible based on my, you know, all my, all my training and my reading and my talking, why would a country ban entry 
about a book. That's bizarre. What a quest, what a weird thing. Um, and so if that happens, I would be really sad. Um, and I think that actually does speak to this issue that Joseph raised of, um, it's kind of scary to do research on sensitive topics because, uh, you know, for me, that's the worst thing that could happen to me would just be getting banned from China. And I would be really sad if that happened, but I'd be fine. Um, but for people in China who try to do research or even just raise questions, the repression is, is immense every year, uh, not just every year, but every time it comes up. And so, uh, so that's why I, I think it's, you know, fantastic. It's just a real privilege for me to be in, uh, at a university where academic freedom is our guiding principle and where tenure means that you can write about what you deem important and worth writing about. Uh, so that, that's fantastic. As, as for sources, uh, I wish I had more sources, but all of them I have to read skeptically and critically because all of them have some kind of ulterior motive or agenda that you know you got to put them together and let them talk to each other because they're actually arguing with each other. And so in the book, I really try to put the sources together to show how people are saying different things about the same questions and the same events. So there's a ton of controversy about it and everybody has diff remembers things differently. Um, but there are enough people who saw the massacre and witnessed it and witnessed the protests uh, that um, that are, there's there's just so much credible evidence of it that um, it's 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 such a stain. I mean, the massacre itself is such a stain on the Communist Party. And as jo I think Joseph is right that uh, overwhelmingly military leaders political leaders, elites did not want a military action against a bunch of student protesters. Deng Xiaoping pushed, pushed it through. Uh, and so it just looks bad, it looks bad. Uh, and so it's, it, it's not part of the, the Chinese curriculum. It's one of those sensitive topics because the Communist Party uh, by definition is Wei Guangzhong, uh, meaning great, glorious and correct. That's what the poster, that's what all the banners say. It's, it's it, it, correct is the key term there because it, 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 yeah, you can make mistakes, but overall you've got to be correct, great and glorious and anything that's not great, glorious and correct. Uh, it's just safer to, to, bear, to bury it, sadly. Thank you. I encourage you to uh, uh, use the raised uh, hand function to join the conversation. Let me call on Chris Buckley who has done so and uh, let's see if we can make the technology work. Looks like you're unmuted. Please introduce yourself to the audience. Hi, I'm, I'm Chris Buckley. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure how to use the video, but I hope you can hear nope. me. You, um, it's, yeah, there's no video. Go ahead. Uh, so um, thanks very much for the, the, the new book, Jeremy. It's, it's really good to have this out here and, and fascinating read. I haven't finished it yet, but I do have a couple of questions just building on the conversation today, including uh, Joseph and Anna's comments. First of all, could you um, tell us more about what is your assessment, having worked for all of this material, about the state of sentiment in the military leading up to June 3, June 4, especially at that sort of troop level where so many of those soldiers are coming from the countryside? Did, you know, is your reading that they needed that they bought the official message uh, about this being an incipient counter-revolutionary rebellion and were ready to go, or do you sense there were misgivings at the at that at that unit level? What's what's your sense of where the military was in those weeks and months leading up to June four and how they responded? And, and secondly, I'm just wondering also as a as a teacher and and all of you may have comments on this. Um, you know, sometimes we hear that. June 4 is now part of, uh, that, that it's been erased by amnesia in China. And of course, Louisa Lim wrote a fascinating book on that. I sense particularly with you, Jeremy, that you think it might be a bit more nuanced than that. And that these memories somehow, uh, you know, subsist, get passed on, that people still share uh, their memories, certainly in private. So I'm just wondering how you size up where June 4 is in China's popular memory in all these decades on now. Thank you. Uh, 
Great question, Jeremy. Yeah, thanks. On the military, I think that's an area in which there's still a lot of ground to cover in terms of future research because the amount of testimony that I got from from soldiers and other people in the military was amazingly small. Only a few soldiers who were part of the, the martial law troops have actually spoken out about what happened afterwards. And, but there's enough, and I think there's enough sort of evidence on the side to show that there was a lot of confusion and a lot of misgivings about what was going on in Beijing and what the military was supposed to do about it. Because just the idea that a military would muster 180,000 plus troops to invade its own capital city, it sounds kind of confusing. It sounds pretty serious, right? And so uh, if there were 180,000 troops invading the city and at the low end of civilian deaths, we have 728 and at the high end, we have 2,600, um, that's actually small. That's actually small. And so the evidence that we have is that a couple of the armies were extremely zealous and shot wildly the 38th Group Army and the 15th Airborne. Uh, but the others, and the, this is one that we have testimony from, from the 39th Group Army, they just wandered around and pretended they couldn't hear the radio that was telling them to advance. Uh, and so many other of the armies uh, did not shoot and did not take decisive action. They just kind of followed along. Um, and so I, that suggests to me uh, a lot of unease and discomfort uh, about what the military was asked to do. And unfortunately, you know, for, for the people who were shot and killed and for China, there were a couple of, of armies that were entering and fighting really zealously. But on memory, uh, I, I just really enjoy teaching students from China here at Simon Fraser University because uh, they come from, you know, they, they come from a background that allows them to get to university in Canada, but they come from backgrounds um, in which their parents are either officials and very cautious and don't want them to talk about politics. And they tell them when they're taking my class, don't get brainwashed by this uh, American Canadian professor. But others, their parents are strongly anti-communist and they remember marching in June 4th and they've been telling their kids about it since they can remember. Uh, and there's that's a large group of people actually that still in private at, at, at their home, they wanna do their own family education that is going parallel to the official education. Uh, and so, and when I talk to people, anybody uh, in terms of just sort of university professors who I mentioned, I'm writing this book to in China said, oh, let me tell you what I, what I saw. Let me tell you what I, and so the, that was in a safer, different political environment than now. Uh, and now I don't think I'd even ask uh, in terms of just protecting people's personal safety. Um, but the memories are there. The curiosity is there. Um, I think Anna really hit the nail on the head by uh, saying that 1989 did through violence try to convince people that you can't have prosperity and a free, a free and open political system simultaneously. And so uh, that's, that's a widespread view that sadly the, the pandemic has indeed uh, solidified a bit. Uh, but people are curious. And there's, there's, a, there's a large group of people that once, once something's covered up, they say, oh, I want to see what's there. What's there? I'm curious. Uh, and, and so that, that does give me a sense that the memories are, are, are definitely there simmering under the surface and, and people are ready to talk about it when they get a chance to do so. Can I chime in on the military yeah, question? Sure. So it looks like there had been a plan to move on the students much earlier than June 4th, but the leadership got cold feet because there was a sense that the military might not execute the orders. So. There's one document at the Bush 41 Presidential Library uh, written by a defense attache that said that uh, a political decision had been made to move on the students on May 20. Uh, and according to Li Peng's memoirs, on May 21st, Yang Shangkun announced that the military would have to regroup for three days for thought mobilization. And Li Peng said the reason was that Deng Xiaoping, quote, unquote, worried that morale in the military was not stable.
Uh, and Shani Zhe, who is a, a senior liberal intellectual working within the party and defected actually after June 4, um, said that uh, to Chun, that the, the Central Guard unit, uh, office, a Central Guard unit officer told him that uh, the fact for three days the military has not entered the city shows how they feel uh, and also told Chun that 80% of their officers all sympathize with the students in Zhaoziang. So over the 20s of May, you see a series of repeated speeches by Yang Changkun, Chen Yun, Peng Zhen, uh, who are very clearly trying to clarify the situation um, because of this confusion, because of the two voices, um, so to speak, that had been coming out of the party center. And Liu Yajou, who's a, uh, a famous princeling, said that if it hadn't been for political work, the commissar system, political education within the PLA, um, that the game would have been up. So they took a few days to rally the elite, to rally um, the soldiers, um, who, by the way, you know, two marshals communicated they didn't want a um, violent solution. Seven generals wrote a letter to the leadership calling for a peaceful solution. The head of the 38th Group Army, Xu Qingzhen, was fired because of um, um, some confusion about whether he would execute the order. So it was really um, kind of a, a very unstable situation within the military, especially in the 20s there. Thank you. Um, let's go to uh, Tim Cheek, who I think also has a question about the military. Um, please unmute yourself. Unmute. Yep. Uh, okay. I'm unmuted. Yes. There we go. Um, I don't know. The um, there, there you have my smiling face. So there you go. Um, the, Jeremy, thank you for this. And um, as usual, Chris Buckley has scooped me uh, with the uh, I wanted. I was I was uh, interested in because I remember reading uh, the story of the tank commander who wandered around rather than driving in to shoot people. Uh, so I'll take my opportunity to shift over to the other. Uh, fresh, uh, one of the other fresh things in your book, and that is the um, looking from the provinces and particularly from, um, to, um, you know, um, Lhasa and Urumqi. Uh, what did you see that sort of is different from the broader story that we have available in the West? Uh, thanks for that question. So yeah, martial law was declared in Lhasa in March of 1989 in response to protests by Tibetans who were prote protesting restrictions on their religious freedom and wanting to commemorate earlier violence against Tibetans uh, in 1959. So they were commemorating an earlier historical event. Martial law was declared, uh, guns, the security forces fired guns at Tibetans. The numbers that we have are unreliable. I don't have firm numbers, but it looks like several hundred died. Li Peng declared martial law. The top leadership seemed to think, wow, martial law, my work here, my it, martial law works in a situation in which you want to get control of an unruly city. Um, and in Urumqi, what's interesting is Anna mentioned the, the protests by Muslims who were upset about a book that insulted Islam. And these were protests that happened in Beijing and Xi'an and Ningxia and all over, including Urumqi. Um, but in Urumqi, they went, on, they went on for a bit longer and um, Uyghurs complained that they were punished even more harshly uh, than Hui had been in Ningxia, just in terms of the prison sentences that they got afterwards. So there was a tremendous diversity in terms of what people were protesting about in the provinces. There was tremendous uh, variety in the crackdowns and the, in the, in the length of punishments and what people were punished for just between provinces, depending on the provincial leadership, Hunan, uh, different from Hubei, different from Sichuan. Uh, those kind of punishments were different, and uh, but I think what I'd like to I'd, I'd love to see a book just about this topic um, because I think even if you just read the provincial newspapers from May of 1989, th there's a rare moment of freedom of the press after May 4th uh, when when journalists get to actually print verbatim the contents of these dialogue meetings between protesters and officials. And so you get to see what the local issues were. And in Shanxi, it was really interesting. Uh, in Shanxi, Shanxi issues are key. Why do we have to, why are we exporting our electricity to the big cities when we keep having brownouts and blackouts in our own province? That's what they were mad about. Uh, and why did you build this palatial complex for the government, for the provincial government offices when we're the, one of the poorest provinces in Shanxi? That's what they were mad about. Uh, so yeah, tremendous variety and diversity and really a lot of avenues for, for future research. 
Thank you. Um, we have a question posted by Carol Kalinowski, who we tried to, couldn't get on earlier in person. Why does the Chinese government not recognize the Tiananmen Square massacre as a photo album, which I share with Chinese students who cry when they say this? Um, what is the current status with the Chinese government regarding the history of Tiananmen Square? Uh, yeah, interesting question, and I'd love to hear what Anna and Joseph have to say about this as well, because uh, Glenn Tifford, who's a scholar who's who's based at, at the Hoover Institution in California, has written a really interesting article saying Deng Xiaop or, or saying Xi Jinping, current, the current leader of China, actually um, strongly endorses the massacre and the crackdown because he believed that China needed a decisive leader like Deng Xiaoping to save China from going down the wrong path. And he sees himself, Xi Jinping, as the same type of decisive leader who would do exactly the same decisive, decisive action if necessary. So if it were up to Xi Jinping, uh, why not just talk about it? Why not recognize it? Why not just celebrate it, right? But it's not celebrated, it's still covered up. And so I think there's still a sort of stasis among the censorship apparatus and the security apparatus that, yeah, this is still a third rail that's still something that we can't touch. It's safer not to talk about where, whereas maybe if Xi Jinping would just want to say, oh, it was correct, let's tell the story. Yeah, it was the right thing to do. Thank you. Um, we're quickly coming uh, uh, upon the uh, end of um, our session. Let me see if we can get a couple more questions in. Um, uh, a question from Amanda Schumann. Um, Interesting to hear that librarians in Beijing happily copied things for you, at least at some point in the past. I find it hard to believe in today's environment. What kind of information did you find in official sources that was surprisingly available? Did you find a gap between this publicly available information and what, at what or how younger generations of Chinese citizens understand the protests? And in conjunction with that, another uh, attendee writes, uh, how many interviews did the author, uh, interviewees did the author interview who claimed to have witnessed the, mas uh, the massacre? Does he still have contact with these interviewees? If so, how are they doing? Do they still want to, uh, do they still want what they pursued on the square then? Yeah, thanks for both of those questions. Uh, for Amanda's question, a lot of the best openly published material that I got and was able to photocopy or buy the books was published in the second half of 1989 when uh, the government and the army were still trying to say openly and in as much detail as possible, uh, here's what we did and here's why it was right to do and here's how it was a heroic action by the military. And so uh, there, there's a number of openly published materials, which is a day of martial law is one of them and those 500 questions book books, those wanted to defend, actually defend the correctness of the decision by giving as much detail as possible. And there's some really telling, interesting details. They gave too, they gave too much detail in some cases. Um, the younger generation, I mean, 1989 was before the younger generation was born. It's ancient history. It's not that sort of key pivotal moment that people who lived through it feel. Uh, and so the younger generation is looking at it as you would look at something that happened before you were born that is your parents thing. Um, and that, yeah, if your government did something that was bad before you were born, uh, so be it, but it's less earth shattering. What's earth shattering today is talking about the Xinjiang internment camps in classes uh, with Chinese students who are forced to confront uh, what's happening in Xinjiang, uh, putting people into internment camps because of their ethnicity or their religion. Whoa, uh, that's what's shocking now. Uh, that's the new, that's the new thing for this generation. Um, as for the question about survivors of the massacre and what people think today, I would really point people to Louisa Lim's book, The People's Republic of Amnesia, because what that book does is, is she talks to survivors and uh, shows the different ways that people respond to trauma. And there, there's tremendous diversity in the ways that people respond to trauma. They shut down or they can't move on or they move on in painful ways. Uh, so yeah, people look back on their past with, with regret or with humor or with all kinds of different reactions. So it, it, as many Chinese people as there are, each one's gonna have a, a different reaction to that question.
Great, thank you. Um, Anna, Joseph, anything you'd like to add at the end of the session? No. Any further thank you thoughts? For me. Great, well, uh, with thanks to Jeremy, Anna, and Joseph, I'll uh, turn this over to Eric. Apologies for those who posted comments that we could not get to. Um, and um, again, thanks for a terrific session. Eric? And my thanks as well to Jeremy, Anna, Joseph, and Christian, and to those of you in the audience. Please join us this coming Monday, June 7th at 4 p.m., when we reconvene the Washington History Seminar to discuss Donald Ritchie's The Columnist, Leaks, Lies, and Libel in Drew Pearson's Washington. Good night and take care.